Um, this is an interview for the Purdue University Library's Oral History Program. My name is Tracy Grimm. I'm the Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration. Today is November 18th, 2015, it's 3 p.m., and I am interviewing Dr. Bruce Rees. Thank you, Dr. Rees, for agreeing to participate in our oral history program. We're, we're happy to, to talk with you today. Well, I'm happy to be a member of the group. <laughs> Thank you. So the first couple questions that I'm going to ask you are, are sort of about your formative years um, before you came to Purdue. Um, we ask these questions to a lot of our alum. Um, where were you born and where did you grow up and what was it like? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, was Provo a small town? I mean, would you consider like that you have small town roots? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was the third largest in the state of Utah, but it had 15,000 people, so <laughs> pretty small town. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, we were wondering, did because uh, we've seen that a lot of the um, engineers that we've interviewed, a, a lot of them come from small towns. Um, did you notice many of your colleagues with similar small town? upbringings or? No, I can't think of any of them that uh, I knew that, that uh, you know, did college early on in engineering, but after they came back, many of them, of course, did, did uh, GI Bill stuff and graduated from college. Right. And most of them became attorneys, as near as I can recall. <laughs> right. Um. Were you ever influenced by reading science fiction or popular science or by aviation feats or space exploration discussions in the media? Uh, not so much. I think my big influence was the fact that the guy I voted the lawn for was the only engineer that I knew. And he'd been, he graduated from Purdue. And he would you know, ask me mathematical questions and I could answer him. And he thought that was pretty great. Oh. I should be an engineer. So. That was about the biggest influence that I had in becoming an engineer. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, would you, could you tell us a little bit about your Navy career? Uh, where did you serve in the Navy? Well, I went to school for 16 months and got an, engin an engineering degree at the University of New Mexico. Then I went to midshipman school for three months. Then I went aboard the Catachan Bay, which is a Navy flat top. And we were on our way to the Japanese coast to be a replacement carrier. And they heard we were coming, and so they surrendered. <laughs> okay. But I never heard a shot fired and anchored in uh -huh. World War II. And I'm really happy about that because a lot yeah. of my friends got killed. Yeah. It's a difficult time. Mike, do you want to? Mike, M Professor Smith's going to ask the next uh, s segments. Sure. Uh, what inspired you to enroll at Purdue? How did you establish that connection, aside from the fellow you lawn mows, uh, mow, mowed lawns for? That was about the only connection. So, engineer I knew, and the only engineering school that I heard much about. So, it was an easy choice. Mm hmm. D did you? take courses with Dr. Zucro early on in your uh, master's program? Yes, he, he, well, the first class that he taught at Purdue, I was in it. Huh. He yeah. came in, in 46 when I came. Wow. Do you remember what it was? Uh, Stephen Gas Turbines. 
and what do you remember most about him, say, as a teacher, then later as a colleague? Well, uh, I think early on I ought to point it out to you that I love the man and admire him more than anybody I ever met. Mm -hmm. I've served on the Army Science Board and the Air Force Science Board and the Navy Research Advisory Committee with presidents of corporations and their chief engineers and all and then I've held a cattle to dock. So early on, I fell in love with him and have been since then. Well, he was quite a man. Uh, we know that. And, you know, this work we're trying to put together to uh, honor him and record his achievements and the lab's achievements um, are as much about his students, too, uh, people like you. So... Uh, it's a big story. I, I do have a specific question. Do you know when and why he was called Doc Zucro? Did that happen before he came to Purdue? or? or? I think he was always Doc. <laughs> That's why he was known at Aerojet before he came to Purdue. Uh -huh. So it, it was just a kind of friendly way to show some respect for the PhD. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any favorite memories of him as a teacher or boss or colleague? Yeah, I, uh, early on, he had people visit him as, as consultant. He was a consultant to them. And they had a great variety of topics. And I thought, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, that he must be the world's greatest bullshit artists because they always go out smiling, happy, come back again. <laughs> Variety of subjects that, uh, you know, I figured he couldn't possibly know all that stuff. And then later on, I found out that <clears throat> in fact he did. Mm -hmm. That he had uh, an office in his basement and the walls were covered with books and you would have picked out any book and it had annotations in it and the steps in there where it says, you know, from this to this, you can develop this equation. You have that t on tissue paper where you develop that equation. So all of the great and noble engineering books of his time, he had read and studied and knew. And that was because during the, the Depression, he couldn't get a job because he's Jewish. Mm. And I didn't know out here in this little town I was in, I didn't know that we, we held those kind of feelings about things, but he wouldn't buy Chrysler automobiles because one time they interviewed him and offered him the job of chief engineer, and he said there was about a two-week delay, and then they withdrew the offer. Huh. So uh, he had a little trouble during the Great Depression. I think that's when he studied all those books. Huh. So you were there at the beginning when there really was no lab yet, no rocket lab. That's right. And what do you remember about how that was put together? Um, you know, really. Well, he uh, he knew a good share of the people in the business. He go see his his buddies, and they would sort of insist, you know, you want some money, Doc. He'd tell them what he wanted. You know, reluctantly, he would tell them how much money he wanted. They would give it. So I think the ONR, the Office of Naval Research, was one of the big sponsors. And then uh, I don't remember who he sold the high-pressure installation to, but that was one of the great contributions, I think, of the lab was uh, the research that showed that you could improve the performance of the rockets significantly if you went to higher pressures. Mm -hmm. And that it was, you know, it was possible to do that. Was it a dangerous place to work in the early days? A little bit, a little bit dangerous because I have acid burns on my arms from nitric acid. But, uh, hey, Bruce, I finally got here. Sorry, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> Rita's here. Hi, Rita. <laughs> so you can tell all your good stories now. I want to hear them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, do, do you recall any special classmates or friends from the early days? Oh, yeah. I uh, remember a lot of these people. This was about the smartest bunch of people that I've ever been around. Early graduate students. We had uh, Jim Skiff's dad, who got one B in his entire career. And that was in theoretical physics because the professor decided there wasn't any A students in his class. He just decided that, and she thought he got cheated, but uh, that's the kind of people we are. And Mike Robinson, I don't think he ever had anything but A's. And Joe Hoffman, <coughs> who succeeded me as director of the lab, I don't think he ever had anything but A's in his career. I wasn't nearly that smart. Mm -hmm. D did you, once the lab was put together out, out near the airport, uh, did you have close connections to the airport itself, to the School of uh, Aeronautical? Well, we had a uh, office in the the uh, hangar at the airport, and uh, we Doc, Doc had an office, and I had an office, and two or three other people had offices there, and uh, we had contact with the Aero School because of that, because Doc had an joint appointment to the ME school and the Aero school until he got mad at Milt Clouser and resigned as a professor of, of the Aero school. He became a full-time ME, ME professor at that point. Milt wanted to review all of his mail, and he wasn't going to do that. <laughs> hmm. you, you certainly saw a lot of changes with the lab from just a, a field to, to become the Jet Propulsion Center under your uh, directorship. and Can you talk about that a bit, how much it changed over those, well, basically 20 years, right? Yeah, I was there, well, as a graduate student and as a professor for about 33 years altogether. And it, it you know, grew from one building with two test centers to the second building with some offices in it to a third building with some more offices. And uh, the second building had some research labs in them. And I did my research in the original building there. We, uh, a guy by the name of uh, uh, anyway, one of my good friends, whose name I can't think of right now, we did some work on the fluid friction characteristics and heat transfer characteristics of fuming nitric acid. Mm -hmm. That's where I got my acid burned from those things. <laughs> oh, I see. You still have the scars? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> you went on to be a civilian director of the Nike Zeus program. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Doc uh, arranged a sabbatical for me at uh, Huntsville, Alabama, at that time in the ballistic missile defense business mm -hmm. as technical director. I spent two years down there, and that resulted really in my appointment as a member of the Army Science Board, which I finally became <coughs> chairman of the Army Science Board. Mm -hmm. And then I got fired because I wasn't an African American, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> Made me a little mad at the time, but. Uh, they didn't fire me off the board, so it was okay. So I didn't didn't, uh, didn't have that effect. They just fired me as chairman. And then I became a member of the Air Force Science Board and the Naval Research Advisory Committee. As I say, I met a lot of fine people, very bright people, but none, none that I thought the caliber was neutral. You certainly got to see each of the branches of the military uh, up close. Do, I did. Do you recall any important differences in their approaches or, or methods, ones that you preferred, say? Well, they did a lot of dumb things. The uh, ballistic missile defense rules said that you had, you're in the middle of a nuclear war and they're raining nuclear bombs down on you, but you have to intercept them at a height that if your blast and their blast will not get an overpressure of a couple more than a couple pounds on the earth, and that's just plain stupid. 
Mm-hmm. You have to filter out the junk, the, the so-called discrimination process, and you get more atmosphere, and that helps a bunch. Mm-hmm. But if you have to intercept them at 70,000 feet, it's harder. Hmm. Do you recall um, ever meeting a Von Braun in Huntsville or any important members? Yeah, of yeah. Doc, Doc Gibbon. I had Von Braun down. And Von Braun, earlier on, Dr. Zucker had made a name for himself in the paper by saying that we would go to the moon, that we could build rockets that would get us to the moon. And then Von Braun came and outlined how he would do it. And he spent two hours there. My wife was pregnant at the time, and she thought that was way too long a speech. <laughs> oh, this was in the Purdue Memorial <laughs> Union that lecture Von Braun gave? Yeah. Did you meet him down in Huntsville, too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, he was in NASA and I was in the Army, so mm-hmm. we, had, we had a briefing, an intelligence briefing. I think it was once a month or once every two weeks or so with, with the you know, technical directors and Von Braun. Mm-hmm. What what was he like, say, in comparison with Dr. Zucro? A very excellent engineer. I think a little bit more arrogant type than, than Doc, but uh, I think that was probably his German background. But he, he was a good engineer. Mm-hmm. What, what would you consider your major accompli- accomplishments with Nike Zeus or Nike Nike? Nike X in those years, um, they were um, famous well, programs. I was the, the technical director when we first made the first so-called quote intercept of an RV going into Kwajalein mm-hmm. from the west coast. We got within, you know, a kill distance there where our nuclear weapon would have destroyed their nuclear weapon, and that was quite an achievement. When, when did that happen? Do you remember? I see. 1980. Mm-hmm. What were the specific challenges of that program over all those years? Well, the, the biggest challenge, of course, was you could build the rockets and you could build the bomb and all that, but the big, big problem was sorting out the junk that the theor- theoreticians could sort of throw at you, the lightweight decoys. Mm-hmm. Which is, can you can you pick out the the one that's got the nuclear weapon from all the junk that comes over that they can throw at you? I hmm. see. And it's still a problem. Mm-hmm. Hmm. How about NASA? Did you ever have close cooperation and contacts there? Well, not with uh, NASA in Huntsville. I was at one time on the, one of the national the NASA advisory. servant and you uh, decide you have to they kick you off all of the committees because you become stupid some way <laughs> <laughs> the, the 70s must have been a challenging decade what with the cancellation of Apollo and and such uh, do, what do you remember about that period not very much You, you were on a fuel additives committee for a time, weren't you, uh, for the health, education, and welfare? Yeah. You know so that that was a, a new path, career path, or do you, what do you recall about those years? Well, it's just committee meetings where the big decisions normally are when you hold the next meeting. Hmm. 
I don't think I don't remember anything that we established there that was very important. I think in some cases in the Army Science Board they would have subcommittees and I think occasionally we did some good the Air Force committees occasionally. Uh, I don't remember anything that we did with the Navy that amounted to much. Mm-hmm. But at least you felt you had some successes on those Army and Air Force uh, panels. Yes. Did, did you recall any of significance? Did um, did young engineers change over all those years? The the people you went to school with. Yeah, I can't hear you, Mike. Oh, how did um, engineering graduates change over all those years? You know, the fellows you went to school with up until the time you re retired. What was it like seeing these uh, new young people come in? Still, I'm not hearing you. Oh, I'm I'm wondering how engineering students changed over the years. The classmates you went to school with versus the new young engineers coming into the labor force as you retired? I uh, told you about some of the brilliant people that came while Doc and I were there. And uh, he hired, he built his staff at the lab. He figured that uh, his bright students were as bright as anybody else's students. So Malachior and Doyle Thompson Bruce Reese and Jim Skistad 
Dr. Reese, was he a tough teacher? I mean, what, what, what was it like uh, being one of his students? He was a tough teacher. Yeah. When you got an A from Doc White, you, you were real pleased. <laughs> but uh, he expected you to work, and he expected you to do what he told you to do. There's no messing around. Mm-hmm. What would you count as your greatest achievement in your engineering career? What do you remember with most pride? I wanted to ask you about them, um, who you remember most, what kinds of jobs they went on to achieve successes in their lives. Dr. Reese, um, what advice would you have for engineering students today? Well, I guess my advice is uh, get an engineering degree. <laughs> spend that money, you know. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you forgot Rita was here, didn't you? <laughs>
would advise people, you know, that, well, I would advise people to do it. Um, say, well, I don't like mathematics, I don't like this, I don't like that. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It sure is. But uh, when, you, when you get done, you can get a job. And I, I really, unfortunately, don't believe in education. I believe in training. I think you ought to be worth more when you finish school than when you began. And a lot of the humanities, if you get done, you can't get a job. And uh, I don't like that part. Of course, I was raised in a depression, so I have a different view of the world than a lot of other people do. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on the future of aerospace engineering and, and or the future of human and unmanned space exploration? We sure have a lot of them here at Purdue. We we work with some of the aero engineering students in our classes, and they're they're fantastic, hard workers. Yeah, they gotta be. Um, but it's a, we're the the last question we usually ask is um, is there anything that we haven't asked you that you think we should have asked you? Well, let me. I put I put some notes together. Let me review my little notes. Oh, great. That'd be wonderful, actually. Let's see. I told you I loved Doc. He was my technical father. Uh -huh. He got me promoted to a full professor about four years after I got my Ph.D. Got me my first consulting jobs. Got me appointed to the Army Science Board as a result of my sabbatical at Redstone Arsenal. I replaced him as director of the lab. I have uh, his grandmother clock oh. that Mrs. Zucro gave Barbara. Oh, how nice. Uh, I mentioned that he treating me exceptionally, he treated me exceptionally well, but and he staffed his lab with his best students. I mentioned Joe Hoffman and Skistad and Malachior and Doyle Thompson. And uh, I mentioned his graduate students could do no wrong. He had no other work, uh, no, no other hobbies than his work. His work was his hobby. Uh, so I originally felt sorry for him without not, not having any hobbies, but then I envied him. <laughs> <laughs> talented in all fields of engineering and uh, was a uh, value as a consultant in all those areas. Uh, I think I've mentioned most of the things that I noted down here. One of the other things that I thought was remarkable that his stories, you know, is, is stories that people tell about this and the other. They never changed. In the 25 years, they never got better. You know, he was never more of a hero or less of a hero or anything else. They were always the same. And I heard them from some of them a hundred times, and they were always the same. And I admired him for that because most, most people, when they tell fishing stories, <laughs> fish get bigger, and the fight was longer, and it was tougher. <laughs> but uh, doc stories were always the same. Do you remember any of those stories, or any of them stand out to you? Well, I remember one one that he told a lot of times. He was uh, in the Chicago area, and this was, you know, when when you still picked up hitchhikers, and he picked up a hitchhiker and drove him into Chicago. 
Chicago and let him out. And then he said that next day the guy's picture was in the paper as one of the big criminals that was in the town. <laughs> and he mentioned that. And he thought that was pretty interesting. <laughs> the guy didn't do anything to him, didn't steal his car or anything. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> sounds like he was more personable with you graduate students. Uh, I guess we've talked to some who had him as an undergraduate and said he was real strict, you know. And yeah, he, uh, as I say, he was a tough teacher. You yeah. had to do what he told you to do. And uh, like most, most professors, he thought his, his class was the important class that you were taking. Right. <laughs> Right. Which is, as I say, a characteristic of most professors. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Can I ask what classes y you enjoyed most teaching over your career here at Purdue? Well, I thought uh, Doc, Doc organized a class on propulsion, which mostly was gas dynamics, and I enjoyed teaching that. I taught it. He would claim he was only gone about three or four days during the year, and that was not true. That uh, I taught the class about a third of the time while he was around, <laughs> and then I taught it full time after that. And then I, I developed a course in missile systems engineering, which I enjoyed teaching because uh, at that time we didn't get much control theory, and that was the. Uh, electronics part of missile systems is probably as important, maybe more important than the propulsion part. So if you're going to be in that business, you got to know more about it than, than we, we were taught. But I enjoyed teaching that. And when I got to be head of the Aero School, I, I enjoyed teaching the undergraduate propulsion course. <laughs> I like the students. That's one of the things that drove me out of the aero school was the fact that you had to deal with the faculty. But uh, I love the students. They're a lot of fun. Did you ever bring them out to the rocket lab, or did you have courses there? Well, you must have been a close-knit group out at the lab. I mean, you were set apart, and you were doing very important work, and high-pressure high work in both senses with your parts and with um, timetables and deadlines and the nature of the work.
Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's <coughs> that's it for our questions. Rita, do you have? Well, I've told you all I know. I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's more in there. We just <laughs> you'll remember. I'm sure you'll remember later, and you'll go, "Oh, I should have told him that." <laughs> well, that's why I wrote down some of these things. I think I told you. <laughs> Yeah. You about. Great. And also, it, you mentioned having some notes that you possibly might have. If, in fact, you find those notes and you would like to give those to the libraries, we would love to be able to have that as a collection of your, of your things here. Okay. Yeah, that would if be... If I find anything that I think would be interested in, I'll mail it off to you. Yeah, because we, she loves, uh, Tracy loves to have notes like scribbled notes that you had on how you were solving problems because the students love to see those kinds of things. Yeah, or your lecture notes. Uh, those are wonderful. No, lecture notes uh, are, are mostly in Doc's books, so they wouldn't be very important. And most of the stuff that I worked on as a consultant was classified. Yeah. I wasn't supposed to have any notes. Right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, we understand that. We... Yeah, we don't want you to jeopardize anything that way, but <laughs> anything, that, anything that you believe that you could actually give to the libraries, we'd be more than still happy not, to I'm do that. I'm still not hearing you. Go ahead. I hear you muttering, but I can't, oh, can't make it out. Sorry, Rita was just saying, you know, that we would, we'd appreciate anything that you feel, you know, that it's okay for you to give to the libraries. We would appreciate, we uh, put it here in the flight archives and the students um, can access papers of individuals and they do actually they do quite a bit come and look at things and get inspired or they write research papers um, it's important for them to to understand you know the foundations and and the history where you know what happened in this in the 50s 60s 70s that that got us to where we are today so well if i find anything and i think we would just i'll sure ship it off to you okay sounds good <laughs> yeah well, thank you so much, Dr. Reese. This is, we're really, really, uh, I'm honored that you were able to talk with us. And um, well, I'm honored you asked me. Yes, thank you. It was nice to meet you and appreciate all of your contributions to the Rocket Lab to Purdue over the years. Thank you, Mike. As I say, not very many people uh, give you very much respect technically when you're 92 like I am. <laughs> I appreciate being called. Well, we appreciate your knowledge, Bruce. Thank you so very much. You bet. Thanks again.